Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. This is the programme where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. My name is Stephen Galpin and with me today are Ranjan Bhattacharya. So you're a commercial property investor and founder of Succeed in Property. Hello Ranjan, welcome to you. Um, secondly, I'm Joanna Leggett, co-founder of Leggett Immobilia in France. Welcome Joanna, welcome back. And Tom Balashev, who is founder of Montague Properties International. Good to see you again. Welcome to you. Okay, um, Ranjan, we're going to go to you for the, uh, for the first question, and it's this. My wife and I have gone off on a whim and bought some woodland. We don't know what we can do with it. We've had various levels of advice about building on it, but none are likely to be achievable in our lifetime. What's more, no one else wants to buy it. Has anyone any suggestions of how we could recoup our position? Uh, it's a very interesting question, and um, I can't really sugarcoat this. You can't really put lipstick on a pig. I think the, uh, the key thing, the key word in that question is on a whim. And if you're doing anything, any commercial property transaction or purchase, you can't do something on a whim. You've got to, ha you've got to start thinking what the end game is, um, what the outcome is and work your way back. Doing things on a whim is just a route to sort of disaster. Unfortunately, I can't sugarcoat this and the market has actually given them the same message in that they cannot find another buyer to take this on. Mm. Um, so there are just are occasions where, um, I mean, commercial property or any kind of property as an investment will work if you know what you're doing. You take the appropriate due diligence and you do the research before buying. And if you go out on a whim, sometimes you will buy something that there's not much you can do with. I think quickly before we leave the EU, it might be, it might be a good idea to have a look at what incentives are there to encourage and, 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 and uh, grow your woodland. I think that's probably the better program. Yeah, isn't? there so are some. See what you can do with it. There are some programs out there, but I think they probably bought it with building in mind by the way the question was asked. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, most undoubtedly a big note. <laughs> I think this maybe is one of those cases where you really have to realise that property is not a five minute business. No, and certainly not a whimsical <laughs> business. Certainly. Okay, uh, Joanna, anything to add to that? Probably the same, yes, to do your research. It's the same with France, you know, buying woodland. There's lots of woodlands in France for sale, but it doesn't all come with building permission. I think well, by the sounds of the question, they're just looking to get a little bit of cash back. So maybe thinking outside the box, see if there's any way to have some type of business that they can use the space for. Maybe like paintballing, some type of, I don't know, probably an endless list of possibilities. But that's probably the most sensible way to try and get some cash back whilst it goes up in value. Sounds to me they've got what they've got. But I think, that, I think that's about it. Yes, and good luck. Yeah. Okay, Joe, let's uh, have a look at your question. What are the most common mistakes that Brits make when buying a home in France? Well, there's quite a few common ones, unfortunately. I think the most important thing is to do your research properly before buying in France. Um, talking about going on a whim, people come over, see their dream home and fall in love with it and then go and buy it. Um, but they haven't done the research on the area. They haven't done the research to see whether the local villages are open through the winter months. They might all close down. It might be a touristy type, type town. Um, so the most important thing is to do good recce trips, to go over there, get to know the area. A lot of people will say we'd like an isolated property but we want to be part of the community. Well buying an isolated property you know could be 20 minutes from the local community so you're not going to be walking to meet to the boulangerie to meet anybody. That's another common mistake. Um, also under, uh, underestimating the building cost for renovation because a lot of people think I'm going to buy this beautiful old barn or this old chateau for example and because the properties are so cheap they're expecting the building cost to be so cheap and actually they're not in some cases they're more expensive than it is in the UK things like paint for example is a lot more expensive in France than the UK and um, so under, underestimating costs is another um, big mistake that people can make and spending too much on a property because everything has a ceiling Taking it past its value. exactly yeah. so you might go and spend 500,000 on a beautiful farmhouse but it might never be worth that much because you know you buy chateaus for that at the, you know these, these days as well 
I think when you've been on the programme before also, you've sort of urged caution about trying to use British contractors over in France. Oh, probably. no, not at all. I mean, British, there's loads of British contractors mm. in France, as long as they're all legally registered and mm. have, are working legally. But I think legally, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't use French or English that aren't registered because they're not insured. Obviously, when you get, get if you're paying capital gains tax at the end of the day, you need registered builders, devies, quotes, etc., et to be able to claim that tax back. Um, and also for insurance purposes, you know, if the roof caves in and you haven't, you've, you've used somebody working on the black, you're not going to be covered. Sure. Okay. Tom, you've got international experience here. What's your? Yeah, well, barely. No, I do. Um, yeah, I agree. I think one of the biggest mistakes that I think a lot of people buying property in general is is act and make a big investment with an emotional decision. Um, I think what Joanna's saying is that taking regular trips to a place that you're kind of earmarking is a good thing to do because otherwise you, you can invest, whether it's 100,000 euros or a million euros, and you've visited a property maybe or an area two or three times. Uh, and it's unlikely if you're in the UK, you would visit a house a handful of times. You go regularly to ensure that it's the right place and you have to apply those principles if you're going to buy overseas. Okay. I think the, uh, the key thing when buying overseas is to decide what the objective is. If it's your second holiday home, and differentiate that from some kind of investment purchase for rental. And be quite clear that the two are um, uh, sometimes mutually exclusive. Um, so if you start making a business decision based on holiday let income, uh, because you've fallen in love, in love with the place, and you expect to use it a couple of times a year, that might not be the best place to achieve um, your rental sort yes. of objectives. Yes. So coming back to you, John, so I, I think effectively what you're saying is pro probably mislocation is probably the most common. common well, I think, I think because obviously we're not in France and people are looking on the internet, they're seeing the dream properties, they're flying out, but they haven't researched the area properly. Um, and the, you know, France is the biggest country in Western Europe, it's huge, so the areas really are different from north to south, the prices vary, the climate changes, you know, depending on where you are. So I think it is really, really important to keep going to the area that you're thinking of buying in, because you'll find your dream house in any area, yes. um, but you need to find your area first. Well, you'll also find it specifically in, in photographs on the internet, which can also <laughs> yeah. be quite misleading yeah. sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> yes. sometimes quite surprisingly good. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, Tom, we're going to move on to you now, another international question. What is the process for purchasing an off-plan property in Dubai? Any tips for buying, um, such as a checklist or things to check into? Yeah, in terms of process, um, it's quite, it's quite open-ended, but to keep things really, really simple, most of the time that people, certainly in my experience, where people have bought overseas, they buy off-plan. So you get a, an idea, for example, we work for a few developments where it's still desert at the moment, but within the next two, three years, it will be a fully completed project. So most of the time, the majority of people buy off plan. So the, the key thing is, first of all, the track record of the developer. Um, there's a lot of money swishing about in the Middle East and it's quite easy for a lot of people to start new development ventures. So you want to deal with a developer who's got a big track record, someone that's done these types of projects before, delivered on time, on budget to a high standard that you think you're buying, that's first thing. Second thing is the infrastructure that's going to be built around the development. You could have an amazing new project with a big developer that is subsequently going to be in an off location. So whether you're buying that as an investment or you're buying it to live, you could end up five, ten miles in one way or the other where you shouldn't be. There's no schools, no local hospitals, so you can have a nice plush development but the wrong infrastructure around it and also work out how you're going to be financing the project. So are you going to look at getting finance directly from banks in the UAE or are you going to look at a cash purchase? So it requires a lot of research and as we were saying in one of the earlier questions, you have to go out there a lot and make sure you've got reputable, reliable business professionals to help you facilitate that purchase. And then in terms of the other points on the checklist, it's the same with any property. The checklist that you'd have if you bought a property in the UK, sure. you'd apply that in, in Dubai as well. Sure. How, how easy it is to check out the track record of developers there? I know, I'm, 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 I don't know, I'm trying to think, go back five or six years and we had a bit of a crash in Dubai, mm. didn't we? And a lot of buildings were not completed, a lot of people lost their deposits, that sort of thing. But I suppose effectively it's not very much different to here, is it, the process? No, it's not. I mean, you know, if we were looking at working with a developer in the UK, we'd typically look at their turnover to be maybe four to five times the value of that site 
So maybe for, for the like, person on the street, it's not easy to go into the financials of a company, but to play it, safe, uh, play it safe because you're an international client buying in a foreign country, pick a big developer. Or if you don't pick a big, big developer, realize that you're taking more of a gamble if you're trying to obviously get a better price point or something like that, but just go with a big name, someone who's done it before. Okay. And in the UK, obviously, we've got a double check, haven't we, on, on sort of deposits that you put down, particularly on, uh, on um, sort of off-plan purchases. You've got the fact that your solicitor may be holding that as um, sort of stakeholder. You've also then got the protection of perhaps NHBC, who will also guarantee the deposit. Any similar schemes in Dubai? Yeah, there are not not really to the to the standard that you'd, you'd feel comfortable with in the UK. I mean, as, as you probably know, typically in, in international property, it's it's slightly different legislation in some cases. But how a developer in Dubai will typically work is they'll want at least maybe two to five percent um, of the purchase total purchase price as a, as an initial payment, and then there'll usually be a staged payment depending on what stage of the completion is. So first phase, maybe another 40%, okay. second phase, and so on and so forth. All right. Franchan, anything to add to that? Um, I think um, when you're buying in places like Dubai, it's important to, and anywhere really, it's important to get the mindset right, because from a UK point of view, we are in an environment where there's lack of supply, mm -hmm. um, and supply demand, but in, there's an imbalance. But in some markets, it's the other way around. I mean, the crash that you mentioned, there was masses of oversupply in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons why, you know, there were whole apartment blocks the size of Canary Wharf that were just empty, if empty, you like. Yeah. Um, so it's important to kind of, as everyone has said, go over there a lot and understand the supply demand dynamics in that area and be appreciative that they are going to be different from the UK okay. and get your head around those. Uh, Ranjan, your second question. Are there any ready-made calculations as to how current commercial land is valued for commercial development as opposed to what it could be worth if permission were given to convert it to residential? I mean, this, is a, this is a question I get asked quite a bit actually and everyone's asking for something ready-made it seems in this world that we're in. Um, commercial property or any property you can value it based on what it is today. That is the bottom line. Um, when you're looking at developing on it um, of course, uh, you may be able to get planning permission for a particular scheme, but that is just a hope value until it's actually realised. So I think the question that is really asking is, if I'm looking at buying a site, um, how do you um, kind of structure the deal, if you like, to buy something that has development potential? So what I always do is you can only look at the site based on what it's valued today you look at what you're looking to do with it. So let's say a hundred grand property is a hundred grand today, but with planning permission, it would be worth 200K. So you do a deal with the land, with the property owner to say, look, um, give me an option to purchase this property um, and I will exercise that option and pay you perhaps 130 grand instead of the 100K it's worth today mm -hmm. if we get permission. So the developer then goes and applies for the permission and secures it. The owner of the property gets the benefit of an uplift for doing nothing, but the developer has de-risked himself mm. from buying a property um, and taking on the planning risk, and then if he fails, then being lumbered with something. Okay. Would you expect to see a premium being paid at the point of taking out the option as well? Um, that all depends. So where we have done it, for example, if we're buying a property and it's empty, um, sometimes the, land, the property owner is liable for business rates or whatever. So we would um, pay him an option fee, which is non-refundable, mm -hmm. to cover his carrying costs okay. for um, owning, for keeping that property for, say, the six months or nine months of that option period, which is fair. Yes, yeah, yeah. okay. So. Fair, a fair deal works. Yes, I yes, think that's yes, it. Joe, anything to uh, put to that? Uh, no, I would say it's pr pretty much the same. I mean, in France, you can put suspensive clauses in to, you know, apply for the planning or outline planning before the sale completes, and if that is rejected, you can withdraw from the sale and get your 10% deposit back. So it that's could work right. like that. But I would say that in France, I would say 90% of the British clients that buy in France aren't buying for investment. It's a lifestyle choice more so. Mm. Different, different world. Yeah. I, I totally agree with Ranjan. I think when you investing in the UK, it's always important to try and bring the seller in 
um, and you can negotiate a much better deal um, without having to exert like an initial like acquisition cost by just buying the property or the land or whatever the case is. So what costs in that case 30% um, more saves you a hell of a lot of time and money in the long term. So yeah, this is the only way to do it really. And as uh, Ranjo said, mitigates the risk. 100%. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Joe, is it possible to buy a buy small commercial properties in villages without being seen as an interloper. French village life seems to be appealing. I'm, an, I'm a shopkeeper who would like to move there, but I wouldn't want to upset the community. Are shops for sale listed anywhere? Um, yes, I mean, you can look on websites, of course. Um, most of the estate agents will have a commercial section for small shops and small businesses, etc., that are for sale. Um, in most villages they would welcome the shop because for me, for example, I have to drive seven kilometres to my nearest shop. So if somebody came and opened one in our village, we would all be delighted. Um, the problem being though is, are you going to have enough trade um, to make it worth living? These are why a lot of these shops are closing down in the small villages. So I would again do your research, go and have a look at the village, see what opportunities there are, what size the village is. Perhaps the local shop has closed down because somebody's retired, um, but the village wants some on back so I would definitely say it's definitely worth doing but make sure that you research that you are going to have enough clients but you know well that's that's no different to here is it not We've got really, small villages yeah. shutting with yes, post offices e exactly but France I mean with it being so big a lot of the communities are very very rural and you know you might be driving 20 minutes to a supermarket so having a local grocery store um, would be good every village has a boulangerie so I wouldn't go into boulangeries unless the boulangerie has closed down um, and a lot of the mayors put in boulangeries for the local village or have a delivery service mm -hmm. that will take it around for the old people and I, I suppose this particular point is quite important this 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 traveling and sort of accessibility of service shops is important especially if you're retiring over there and you're over a certain age you know traveling does become an issue doesn't mm -hmm. it well, if you were retiring to France, again, do your research. I wouldn't be more than half an hour from a city because you're going to need hospitals, doctors, etc., etc. Um, so you don't want to be driving too far if you do need those services. So again, village life or town life might be better for a retiree than somewhere. Just on that subject, how, how easy is it to migrate your, you know, your perhaps um, health requirements, you know, in terms of medication and that sort of thing, from the UK to France? Well, that's quite simple. You just make an appointment with the doctor and you take in what medication you're on. And obviously it's the same. It may just have different names, you know, French names as opposed to the UK. But it is quite a simple process. But you have to get yourself into the health system first. Right. And does that cost money? It doesn't cost money, but if you're not paying tax and you're a retiree, at the moment it's reciprocal. With Brexit, we don't know what's going to happen. So that is an issue at the moment. So I would definitely wait and see um, what well, the deal we've, is. We've not only got the complication <laughs> of Brexit, we've got the complication of a new government now, yeah. we're on top. So um, <laughs> yeah. Just a, a quick, quickly on the, um, the questioner. Um, I wonder whether they are looking to set up a shop as part of a lifestyle thing. And a lot of people get involved in lifestyle. I mean, here, people want to set up a pub. They you know, think it's some sort of glamour or something like that. Mm -hmm. And my advice to people like that is um, get a job in one. You know, get a part-time job or uh, you know, when you go down there in France, get a job in a, in a shop. Uh, do that for three or four months and see whether you really like the lifestyle before you put hard cash into buying premises and setting up your own yes. um, I, I think that's very good advice. And I mean, of course, the other thing is, um, as you say, identify what you want, whether it is lifestyle, whether it's business, whether it's investment, because um, maybe if you had a shop, you might just enjoy having something to do, as sim simple as that, in which case the turnover, the profitability becomes far less important. But if it's going to be critical to your finances, it's really important mm. to get it right. Tom? Exactly what I was literally, you took the words out of my mouth. It's, it, it's a lifestyle decision based on that question, but it's a business decision on whether a shop would work in an area or whatever the case is. But an alternative that we've had a lot of experience with with clients has been where people have um, bought into property that has some type of commercial retail use, and they, whether they've lived out the back of the property or, or on the top in some type of apartment, and then it becomes that they own the building out freehold and they mm. don't have to worry so much about whether the the, the turnover of the shops enough to keep the bills going and where they can pay their mortgage and, sure. it, and it can you can have that happy medium of something more artisan like craft or 
um, some type of like food, beverage, that type of thing. It just becomes a more enjoyable lifestyle. So, Okay, great. Well, thank you all very much for that. Tom, your question. When overseas properties are built to a high standard, aiming at a high-end owner, are these properties more viewable on the same sort of portals that you'd look at for, for standard properties? I'm not quite sure what that means, standard properties, but um, or are there specific sites for looking at upmarket properties abroad? In, not in my experience. Um, I think to use like something like Zoopla or Rightmove, any agent, as you probably got a lot of experience as well, mm. any agent is just going to want to list their property that has the most traffic and the most views. The person who's selling a 10 million euro development versus, or sorry, house versus someone who's selling a 100,000 euro, they just want someone to buy it, so they don't really care who it goes to. Yeah, on, on kind of a higher end, there are people that will have high-end off-market deals, so stuff that maybe doesn't go through agents uh, but is for sale, and then that's going to be down to network and stuff like that. But based on the way that question's written, I think just stick to a big platform. And I think on the on the internet now, it, it it's quite easy to differentiate between agents who've sort of got it who, or who haven't, and probably more important to say. Hundred percent. Yeah, quite easy. So Joanna, that's well, good I'd, subject I'd for you. say that it's, um, I would choose an agency that has a good marketing department because at the end of the day, if you're selling a high end property, it's the service that is going to win through. Um, so you know, putting it on portals is great. It gets everybody looking at it. But if the service level doesn't match, um, you know, nobody's going to buy it. They're looking for service and they're expecting service if it's a high-end property. Yeah, that's so actually a really good point. You want yeah. someone to be able to, if you do get an interested party, someone that's going to actually be able to finish that transaction for mm. you and not just waste a really good inquiry. Yeah. And a good agency will choose the right portals to put the properties yeah. on, um, you know, particularly high-end portals, and then we'll be able to follow it up with the service. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'm almost, uh, always in awe of the sort of service you guys offer to, to people who buy abroad because, you know, um, you're almost down to answering daily questions. Where do I post a letter? Where do I buy this? Where do I tax my car? It is a Where, complete hand-holding yeah, service. It really I mean, is, We've got it? children into schools. I mean, yes. you wouldn't have an agent in the UK no. setting up a meeting with a headmaster and taking the children along to get them into schools. I mean, it is a hand-holding service, mm. particularly because of the language barrier as well. Yes, mm. of course, yeah. I, know. I think uh, I can only comment from uh, the point of view of looking for a holiday home for our own uh, family abroad and I think that in this world everyone thinks that everything's on the internet and I would just reiterate and underline the importance of hauling your backside out there and shaking hands with a few agents and letting them know your requirements. One of the things I've found is that all the agents they market things very professionally with nice photos and all of that and it takes time to get often get those online mm. so if you've made the relationships you often get a call saying it is not on our website yet but it's coming up they know your requirements and um, I think that's a very important uh, aspect to seriously looking for a place abroad getting your backside out there mm. well, one last thing on that because the, the question was about being high-end mm. The reality is if you go to a top, top agent in any part in Europe, France, Italy, Portugal, wherever it is, some, like if you look at people that are like international, like a Knight Frank, a Savile, something like that, a high-end a high property I'm thinking is like plus five million euros, mm -hmm. they will most likely have a, a selection of buyers that would be interested in something at that point in the market. So make That's the calls beforehand, say this is what I'm thinking about bringing to market, they might say, yeah, we've got 10 people who would be interested in that. You can save yourself a hell of a lot, so I might not even need to go on a portal. OK, great. Well, that's all we've got time for in this show. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Ranjan Bhattacharya. Thank you to Joanna Leggett. And thank you to Tom Balashev. Thank you all very much. Join us again next time on Property TV's Question Time.